Selamat pagi tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian. Uh, good morning uh, in particular to Captain Kanan, uh, Mr. William, Tuan Suwaidi and Mr. Ramesh and our honoured uh, participants uh, who have so gladly chosen to attend this webinar. My full name is Ravindran Subramaniam. Uh, I am excited to share this wonderful sport, uh, something that I've loved tremendously. I have many passions uh, besides flying. Uh, there are other things that I'm passionately involved in. The other being, of course, unmanned aerial vehicles. But this is one thing that has stuck with me and just refused to go out of me. Uh, and uh, there are good reasons for that. Uh, so, I intend to spend about 40 minutes sharing both uh, slides as well as some video clips. And then towards the end, about 15 minutes, I'll take questions and answers to which members of the audience may also chip in their responses because there's obviously a wealth of knowledge amongst all of you. So, uh, let me begin by first showing this particular slide. All right. Uh, this normally is the face of aviation. Right? Um, when, when we talk about aviation, what we see are the large aircrafts, because uh, that's what occupies the commercial world. But little do we know, uh, except for a privileged few, I may call it, uh, that there's another side of aviation which where we fly low and slow. Uh, very simple, very basic aircraft, which uh, Mr. William just said goes back to the Wright Brothers days. Yes, in many ways, it's quite right. So let me share with you the other side of aviation. Now, I would like to begin my talk with a video clip because uh, if a picture can say a thousand words, a video can give you a billion images. So share. Uh, let me share this video clip. Sit back relax it's just about five six minutes and probably you'll get an idea of what micro flying is about this is taken locally in malaysia at apomosa flight park <clears throat>
Okay, uh, what we saw is uh, a video clip of actual microlight flying around year 2000 at A Formosa Flight Park uh, in A Formosa Resort. We had our own dedicated runway. We had our own microlight flying club. We had our own uh, microlight aircraft, and we had a wonderful time uh, flying there until uh, they decided uh, that they wanted to build houses on the runway. Uh, but anyway, that's another story for another day. Um, let me now go through, and uh, I must begin the slide with some basic terminologies. Let me assure you, this is the only slide with what I call heavy metal, uh, a fairly heavy stuff for some. Uh, the objective, not that I want to drown you into this or uh, immerse you, but at least be familiar with some of the terminologies. I won't go too deep, uh, just a cursory glance. Microlights, you may also hear the term ultralights. There's been a lot of confusion, even among aviators. Uh, they say ultralight means another thing and microlight means another thing. No, they are the same. The only difference, gentlemen, is microlight is a British origin name. Ultralight is the American equivalent. So let's get this right. Microlights, ultralights, they're the same. In the US, they are referred to as ultralights in the flight aviation regulations. UK, in the civil aviation, is referred to as microlights. So one and the same. Let's understand that concept first. Now, this category of aircraft, mainly for recreational purposes, can be kit built. That means bought in the form of a kit, completely broken down and we assemble it. Uh, I was involved in the assembly and so too in JSYD who has been to the factory in California. Uh, it can be home built. Home built means you either draw up your own plan and build the aircraft yourself or buy the plan, buy the materials and you build the aircraft yourself. Uh, there's a lot of work involved. It can take as long as a couple of years if you're doing part time. Quite a number of Malaysians have done this in their garage, in a rented shop lot and so forth. Or they can be factory built. Uh, this is the best because they are done by the experts. You just buy it over and then you just off the shelf, you fly it. Easy peasy, Japanesey. But then uh, some of us, especially people like me and perhaps even Captain Kanan and many others, I don't know. We like to have a hands on. We like to build things and put it up for flight. Uh, that's a different sense of joy there. So remember, it can be kit built, home built or factory built. Okay, this is another heavy metal stuff, IQ, International Civil Aviation Organization. Much of the commercial aircraft are operating under the auspices or under the regulations or annexures issued by the International Civil Aviation Organization. Now, the category of aircraft that we are dealing with this morning, micro lights or ultra lights, also known by several other names, which I will expose you later, are considered sub-IQO. That means they are not controlled by the International Civil Aviation Organization. What does that mean? That means it's country specific. Various countries have their own regulations regarding microlights and ultralights. They don't merge in a common platform. So that's why it's considered sub-IQO. Certified, non-certified. Yeah, this is another heavy metal stuff. Certified, generally, it means both the aircraft, the engine, the systems uh, go through uh, various uh, processes of checks and they are built in accordance with stringent rules and testing. Whereas non-certified, they do some testing, yes, but not to the extent of certified aircraft. So obviously, Non-certified will be cheaper because the cost of bringing it for use is less. It need not go through so many stringent procedures. The question often asked is, are they safe? Well, I've fly, flown so many hours on this aircraft. Let me assure you, they are safer than even certified aircraft. Uh, I'll explain this a bit later as I go on and uh, why I say that. Now, the aircraft generally can be used generally for yeah? uh, commercial purposes, like Captain Kanan is a commercial pilot. 
He flies for bread and butter. That's a commercial use. Carries both people and uh, cargo. Uh, then, of course, you have military applications. Uh, even drones, you have increasingly uh, military applications. Then the segment that I belong to is the recreational side. That's a huge following in Europe, the US, Australia, and several other countries. But in Malaysia, it came up very well, then stopped. And we are trying to pick it up, but let's see where it goes. But there is fantastic scope for recreational flying. All right. Experimental sport aviation, light sport aviation. Microlites and ultralights have gone through various nomenclatures, various names over the period of time. Experimental aircraft basically means it does not comply to the airworthiness requirements of the particular country or of manufacturer or bill or registry. So in other words, it's strictly for experimental use for non-commercial purposes. Sport aviation, as the name says, is for sports use. Light sport aviation, that's a category where it's even lighter than the Cessna 172 or a Piper Warrior, as we, you may call it. So all these belong to the non-certified sub-IQ category. All right. Uh, wings are very important in an aircraft because the wings give us the lift. If the wings fail, your aircraft comes down like a ton of bricks. Unless, of course, you have a parachute or uh, attached to it. Most aircraft that we see, like the Boeing 747, the wings are fixed. Of course, the wings have many moving surfaces like flaps, ailerons, spoilers, dampers. Uh, Captain Kanan can give you a big talk on that subject. Various uh, moving surfaces on the uh, wings to change the curvature or the camber of the wing to produce lift. And then you have a rotary wing. Rotary wing, as we all know, are helicopters. The propeller on top is classified as a wing, and they are moving around in a circle, just like in a drone. So it's a rotary wing to some extent. Then you have flexi wing, where the whole wing can be flexed, uh, left and right, or forward and backwards. And that changes the dynamics of the airflow over the wing to give you lift, or drag or whatever is required for the different phases of flight. Collapsible wings are normally uh, 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 flying um, devices such as uh, paramotors, powered parachutes and so forth, where once there is no more wind blowing into it, the whole wing just But in flight, because there's air uh, flowing into the wing, it holds the thing in a very rigid format. I will show you an audio clip of a collapsible wing aircraft later on. Last but not least is the various licenses. On the highest end, ATPL or Airline Transport Pilot License, that's the highest license one can have in aviation. Captain Kanan obviously has an ATPL, otherwise he cannot be a commander of the flight. But then uh, one step below that is the commercial pilot's license with instrument rating and maybe multi-engine too. Uh, it's a commercial pilot license. Uh, you, you can still fly with this, but not in the capacity of a commander. PPL, I think most of you all know, is a private pilot license. Uh, that's the basic entry to go into a CPL. Uh, you fly aircraft like Cessna 172, Piper Warrior, and so forth, all single engine aircraft. Then the license that we had in Malaysia for microlights at that time was what is known as a PPL, Private Pilots License Restricted, bracket restricted, restricted to that category of aircraft. Um, this license has been temporarily suspended in Malaysia. I've tried to revive it, but it has come to naught at this stage. But I think we keep banging on the door, somebody will open eventually. It's That's the way things work. Uh, Right. So these are the only heavy metal stuff that I need to share. Uh, you don't have to remember anything. Even if you can, the, the name sticks to your mind is good enough for this purpose. I promise you there's no more heavy stuff hereafter. Phew. And then, of course, one more, land planes and sea planes. Your license is authorized to fly either aircraft on the land or a float plane for the sea. These are the two broad categories. So you see in aviation, there's so many things involved. 
All right, this is a classic photo I had. Very good memories flying this aircraft, Niner Mike Echo Alpha Yankee. It's a Quicksilver two-seater Spot 2S. Captain ID will know this aircraft very well. It's powered by a Rotex 5A2 two-stroke engine running on hear me, hear me, hear me. More gas. What is more gas? More gas is motor car gasoline. We can just buy the fuel from any petrol station, Petron, Petrona, Shell, whatever, Ron 92, Ron 97, put it in and fly the aircraft. It's easy as that. So if I were to say land somewhere, uh, make a forced landing somewhere because of fuel exhaustion, I just take my jerry can, go to the nearest petrol station, buy the petrol, pour it inside, start it up and start flying again. But of course, we don't fly the aircraft until fuel exhaustion. That's foolhardy um, exaggerating there. But it's as simple as that. It runs on more gas, M-O-G-A-S. This is a kit aircraft. We brought it from US, from California in the form of a kit. We assembled it ourselves. I was in, involved in test flying the aircraft to comply with the permit to fly for the Civil Aviation Authority of Malaysia. Here we are the same aircraft. We, uh, Julian Julian is a Brazilian. He used to come and fly with me quite often. We are pushing out the aircraft out of the hangar to prepare for flight. It's a fixed wing aircraft. Okay. Okay. This is a, a similar fixed wing aircraft, but the difference is it's a single seater. It's known as an Aerolite 103. Aerolite 103, um, why they call it 103? It complies with Federal Aviation Regulations Part 103, where in the US, such aircraft, if it's a single seater, you can fly with no license. They are at that stage. You don't even need a driving license so long as you're flying away from the busy areas, you're flying in you know, a farmland and so forth. Part 103, you don't need a license simple aircraft obviously a single seater you must have some prior knowledge otherwise you can't fly this aircraft but some people still do if they have a big area that they do some reading maybe flying for dummies 101 or whatever and they take to the air they are daring anyway that's where adventure is all right this is an example of a flex wing aircraft the whole wing you can see the wing is uh, there's a bar which pushes the wing in either left or right, forward or backward. You can see three units, and these are guys who flew in this aircraft all the way from Desaru in Johor to a Fumosa Resort. Three of them, they fly combined. Uh, we had a jolly good weekend at the Malacca Air Carnival, and then they stayed at a Fumosa Resort, uh, an example of a flex wing aircraft. This aircraft, Airborne, comes from Australia. Uh, this is the same aircraft. Uh, this is uh, Joe Ong. Joe Ong is a Singaporean. He owns the aircraft. Probably looking out for that. This is where it's so simple, you know, to check the weather. We don't have to look at any instruments. We just look into the sky in the distance. If it's clear, okay, it's good to go. So they are looking at the weather for possibly uh, taking out the flight. I think they are preparing for the flight already. Same flash wing aircraft. They are lining up. This one belongs to Dr. Lee. Dr. Lee is a cardiologist in Malacca. He is one of those who are tried to uh, do his home-built aircraft in a rented shop lot, but then his surgery keeps him busy. He could not complete his uh, aircraft, but that's another story. Uh, this is uh, his strike. He's, I think, uh, lining up for takeoff at Evomosa Resort. This is another interesting thing. It's a gyrocopter that comes from Spain, I think. Uh, it's in a Formosa Resort at this point of time. It's a cross between a helicopter and a fixed wing aircraft. Uh, very beautiful to fly this aircraft. It's wonderful. Of course, there are many variations to this. Uh, this is quite a simplistic one. Running on a Rotex 912 four-stroke engine, two-seater, tandem in front and back. Okay, this is another one. This is owned by a Malaysian a rotary wing with a helicopter, single seater, uh, known as Mosquito. Uh, I'm not too sure what power plant they use, but I do know it's a two stroke engine. Um, I've seen the aircraft flying. Uh, 
uh, well, there you are. A helicopter has come almost as small as a matchbox. Well, exaggeration, but that's what technology is. Uh, they made it smaller and easier. Beautiful aircraft. Uh, uh, this is the one that I'm really in love with because uh, Aeroprac A22, also known as Foxbat from Ukraine. I came very close to owning one of this. I was supposed to go to Ukraine, assemble this aircraft uh, in the factory under the supervision of the factory engineers, test fly it, dismantle, put in a container, a 40 feet container, bring it back and start my own flying club. Um, but my partner chickened out at the 11th hour, so the idea fell flat. But trust me, it's still in my mind. It may come back. Beautiful aircraft, almost similar to a Saturn 150, but running on more gas. For fuel, I did not use aviation gasoline at all. And this is the interior, very basic analog instruments. You have the engine instruments on the right hand side, your flight instruments, artificial horizon, your airspeed indicator, altimeter, radios, your fuses, uh, your fuel switches, the, the whole works and dual control. So very good for flight instruction because when I have a side by side uh, dual radio on either side, it's very good for flight instruction. I have many hours flying this uh, because this aircraft uh, is owned by Mindanao Saga Flying Club, of which I'm a member. I used to go to the Philippines before the COVID, very often to fly. Uh, beautiful. This is the same aircraft, but this time with digital instruments. You can see the small insert. The small insert has more instrumentation. Uh, digital instruments have benefits of their own. You can put in much more data available for you. You concentrate on your flying. If something would be outside the set parameter, you'll either hear an oral warning or a, a visual light coming up so that it may possibly indica indicate uh, temperatures exceeded or airspeed indicated or whatever it, the parameter is. Um, so a bit more expensive to fit in, but it gives you. But in flying this category of aircraft, we always say the less bells and whistles, the better. Why? Easier to maintain. So less of these gimmicks, easier to maintain, easier to fly. Otherwise, you spend more time maintaining them. The cost of ownership and operating increases. But well, some people like uh, the, the dressings. OK, flying is about continuous learning. You learn, definitely you learn science. You, you cannot run away from that. There's so much science. Bernoulli's principle, coefficient of lift, it's all science. Technology, you understand materials, uh, different types of aircraft grade materials. Engineering, you have to understand engineering things like compression, tension, shear, torsion, bending. All these mechanical stresses you need to understand uh, so that you don't exceed the limitations of that designed material or apparatus. Mathematics, not exactly calculus, but you must have a flair for numbers, ability to do the weight and balance uh, almost uh, instantaneously. Uh, it's very important. Fuel calibration, fuel calculation. Um, so if you got a flair for numbers, obviously you will fit in very well. And no stop to learning. I myself, this was taken in Canada, Kelowna, which is north of uh, Vancouver by about six hours of beautiful drive around the lakes. Uh, we went to learn about how to maintain the Rotex 912 four stroke engine. That being one of the requirements if you wanted to own your own aircraft. Remember I mentioned I wanted to go to Ukraine, assemble and own my own aircraft. So this was one of the requirements. I went, I enjoyed, because uh, what we did is we learned theory, of course, the whole structure of the four-stroke engine. Then this is the best interesting part. Groups of four of us are given one old engine, a running engine, a running engine, Rotex 912. We were required to strip it down completely, clean it up, decarbonize or decoke it, uh, take the various measurements check for tolerances, internal, external, whatever, and put it back, calibrate it, and then you install in the aircraft, 
and you would test fly it. But before they install the aircraft, you of course test it on a test bench. Uh, this is in Canada. So interesting phase. There's so much of learning that you go through, and that's Rotax aircraft engines uh, maintenance depot. Uh, this was in uh, Corning, California, a few years later. Here, this picture shows me and my friend. This guy, he's from Texas. He flew in, for, he flew in from uh, Texas all the way to Corning in California using his own aircraft. And here we are setting up the flight control systems. You can see the control stick here and the rudder pedals, the cables running. We are supposed to set up the control systems, the cables uh, with no play, uh, giving you the precise amount of deflection on the control surfaces whether it be the elevator, rudder, or ailerons, or whatever it may be. Uh, so, and we spent the first two days in this course learning nothing about the various types of fasteners in the aircraft, screws, bolts, nuts, washers, you name it, two days. And of which they just gave us a tray full of nuts. We are supposed to identify what exactly they are, find out the part number and whatever. So can you imagine, I went to California to learn about nuts and bolts. Anyway, so here we are teaching our potential students. Uh, this is a pre-flight briefing. Uh, these are three students uh, scheduled for the day for the flight. Uh, we explain to them what are we going to do for the day and uh, what kind of maneuvers you can expect. And a pre-flight briefing, it's part of flying continuous learning there. Uh, these are certified aircraft when outside the Royal Slangoff Flying Club, uh, Nina Mike, Zulu Alpha Romeo. I think we are preparing for a flight to Mersing, I think, Tioman. We went to Tioman. So uh, this is a different category, but I'm just showing you the comparison between certified and non certified. Obviously, uh, they have more bells and whistles. They fly a bit faster, carry four people. It's, it's a different type of fun. More expensive, let me tell you. More expensive. All right, uh, I tried to come up with the rules and regulations uh, because the old rules and regulations known as AIC or Aeronautical Information Circular, two stroke 97 and 597 have been repealed. Repealed, but not replaced. So in 2019, I drafted the whole works, the complete A to Z, and I wanted it to be called, or I suggested it be called as a Malaysian Sport Pilot License to cover micro lights, experimental aircraft, light spot, the whole works. All the aircraft below 750 kgs. Why I say 750 kgs? That's a standard adopted by YASA, European Aviation Safety Agency. Of course, uh, UK just lately, about last month, uh, micro lights, they classify if land base is 600 kg and below, if it's a float plane, 650 kg. But I thought, let's have one umbrella, 750 kg and below, and cover everything else within there. So I gave it to uh, the former director of Light Ops, but they've been busy on so many other issues, I understand, one of which is the FAA audit. Anyway, uh, it's not the end. We can always kick the ball in again, all right? And this is the syllabus that I built, um, you know, what kind of exercises you need to do for the flight test. Nothing new. I did not reinvent the wheel. Let me be frank and honest. Okay, It's already there. I just remapped it, uh, cleared a bit of cobwebs here and there, fine-tuned it to meet with current needs. I think you probably need about 30 or 35 hours in this category of aircraft to get your private pilot license. Uh, you, you do all kinds of exercises, but pre-flight, line up, take off, cruise, descend, land, and then engine out landing, uh, practice force landing, you call it. So the whole works are there. The ground subjects you study are very interesting, actually. Uh, air law, meteorology, which is about the weather, navigation, how do you move from one point to another, human performance limitations, uh, understanding, because when you're flying is about man, machine, and environment. Remember, flying is about man. Because you're the pilot, man is controlling it. Machine, obviously you're flying the equipment and the environment. You must be familiar with the environment. So we understand the limitations of the human being. Radio telephony, uh, how you converse in the air with both 
the air control uh, tower as well as other uses of the airspace. And yes, get this right, aviation English. English is a compulsory subject in aviation. You those interested in aviation must get a minimum of a credit in English. Uh, if you're going to become or plan to become a commercial pilot, you must pass your aviation English exam. If you fail your aviation English exam, you can be the best pilot, but the license is denied because uh, there is a lot of safety uh, uh, involved in the process of communication. So again, there you are. Uh, the same subjects go across all levels from PPL all the way up to ATPL, but more in depth, more in depth, more in depth. Right? Uh, this is a very interesting slide. This is, by the way, another example of a micro light, but of course, slightly more advanced. It's not a tube and fabric. It's covered by uh, some uh, better materials. Uh, this is um, Captain Arohi Pandit. Uh, she was funded and sponsored by Women's Empowerment Group. She is the first woman in the world to cross both the Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Ocean and the Iceland Cap solo in this category of aircraft. This category of aircraft, micro light, flying solo across the Atlantic Ocean. Pacific Ocean. There you see, so we always say, nothing can dim the light that shines from within. If you have the fire within you, that fire will definitely grow. Um, so it is not something that can be dimmed. It's still there, it's burning. We may get that Eureka moment in due time. Now, I've come and covered a lot about What's going on? So let's come closer to home. You recognize the face there, obviously. Captain Kanan and, and together. But the gentleman in the center is the focus. This guy is a simpleton, a Chinese guy, um, Malaysian, of course. Doesn't speak English at all. But he, Achong, his name in Kuala Sawa, Rantau, and Agri Simplan, he assembles, he builds his own micro lights in his own hangar. Uh, sort of ramsackal, uh, you know, uh, sort of setup, but he gets things going. He buys aluminum tubes from Ditalin. Um, the canvas sheet to cover the wings is normal uh, canvas that you buy in the hardware shop. His wife who has passed away, used to sew the sails, and we had lovely flying hours with him, Achong. There you see his aircraft here. I think he has landed somewhere in Port Dixon, I think, uh, two-seater. Entirely built by him. Uh, it's not a kit at all made in Malaysia. Let me show you this video clip. Okay, that's bush flying for you. Sorry, uh, Mr. Ravin, can I just yeah. uh, interrupt a little bit? Yeah, go okay. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, is it where, where we went to meet him? Is it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, okay. Thank you, sir. All right, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, that's uh, Captain Kanan asked a question. A uh, very good question, Captain Kanan. Thanks for that. Yes, Captain Kanan and myself, we went and visited his hangar in Kuala Sawa in Rantau, Negeri Simbalan. Captain Kanan will testify. This guy probably can give him a PhD for aerodynamics. Like, I don't know. He knows so much, you know, and he has got no education per se. There he is on the, my left, uh, Achong, in my hangar in Formosa. I considered him as my Sikh who, uh, anytime I have any problems, I call him. He'll come within a jiffy and help me out. He's a very humble guy, a very nice guy, Achong. 
Okay, this one uh, I must share with you. The picture is a bit blur, but it's historical. 2003. Uh, sometime in August uh, 2003, my company, A Fumosa, they bought three units of this aircraft in, from Langkawi Flying Club. And they want to dismantle the aircraft, put it in a container, and bring it back to A Fumosa Resort. I told them, no, 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 I'm going to fly it back. And they said, no, how are you going to fly it back? It's so fragile. And that one, leave it to me. So I organized a group of pilots uh, there, Captain Nasa on uh, the red shirt, gentlemen. Captain Nasa is now the head of training in Malaysian Island System. Of course, yours truly in the overalls, black. And then Captain Maras, uh, Maras, uh, Maras is with Qatar Airlines, I think on Boeing 787, I think. Achong, the center on the right hand side. Then Jamal, Jamal is another av aviator. Uh, he gave us ground support throughout. Um, this one, we flew the aircraft, three units of this aircraft from Langkawi across the Langkawi waters into Alostar Airport. We landed at Alostar Airport and, and the moment uh, people came to know that we are flying the Langkawi waters uh, using this category of aircraft, the gentleman in the bush jacket is the state expo for tourism. He came to meet us uh, at, at the airport. He was very excited because all the while people have been telling him that this aircraft cannot be flown over the stretch of water between Langkawi and the mainland. And here we are, we did it. Three units, mind you, all safe and sound. Um, we had wonderful photographs taken, blah, blah, blah. And of course, that evening, we departed immediately for Taiping, where we overnight uh, in Taiping. Then next day, continued to Jandarata, Wadixen, and finally, Epomosa. Uh, but there's another interesting piece of information I need to share. Why this one, I cannot forget. I lost 2,000 ringgit of Malaysia cash, solid cash, in flight. Open flight deck. I had the money in the pocket in the overalls. And my headphones, uh, the cable was on the inside the pocket there. The guy didn't want to flap around, left it there. Captain Maras was at the controls and he was on the radio. I was just enjoying that, that sector I was just enjoying. Then Captain Maras said, hey, can you uh, take over the controls and take over the radio? So I pulled up the cable from my pocket and apparently that envelope containing the money was ripped off together and it fell down. I didn't realize it. Uh, I landed in, or rather we landed in Taiping Airport. Then we checked into the hotel for one night. Hey, the cash is not there. Then I was just wondering, then uh, Captain Mara said, hey, I saw something falling off from the aircraft. Then I knew that money must have gone. So guys, anyone who's going to go for a treasure hunt, is somewhere between Alostar Airport and Taiping. <laughs> go look for it, 2,000 ringgit solid cash. All right, this is the one, the collapsible shoot. Okay, that's a collapsible shoot. You can reach it once you start flying. Flying is all about joy and happiness. Here we are taking people out for joy rides. Weekends in Afomosa, we used to be extremely busy, one after another, the whole day, people coming for joy rides. And everyone has a wonderful smile before and after. And of course, <laughs> this one, I just put it up a gimmick. There's an airline in Alaska named after me, Ravin Airlines. If I ever have the chance to fly commercially, I like to work for these airlines and just pretend that this airline belongs to me. So, gentlemen, we always say in aviation uh, that uh, the sky's the limit. But to quote the words of uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, da Vinci, once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your, uh, with your eyes turned skywards. With this, I thank you for being with me. It's coming up to exactly 40 minutes now. I pass back control to the moderator. Apologies if I've gone a bit fast, but in the interest of time, I had to do that. Thank you and back to you, sir.